It was Monday morning at 8.20 that the shooting began at the Washington, D.C. Navy Yard. Thirteen people died that day, including the former Navy reservist who's charged with the massacre of 34-year-old Aaron Alexis. As the nation once again struggles to cope with a mass shooting, something that's becoming more and more common, a portrait is emerging of a deeply troubled young man with easy access to firearms, a common thread in this kind of violence. Now, is this really something that is simply beyond us as a society to comprehend? Is it beyond us as a society to do anything about? Well, in looking for a way to address this tragedy on this week's show, I really could not think of any other voice that could offer the perspective that I think is needed as that of Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III, who is the pastor of Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago, a community that's been particularly hard hit by gun violence. I've read Reverend Moss's comments uh, about this violence. He speaks with wisdom and with compassion. Uh, He also has deep personal experience with the tragic toll that mental illness can take. So I am very, very grateful to be able to welcome to State of Belief Radio, Reverend Moss. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you so very much. It's an absolute delight to be on the show with you. What uh, What was your first reaction when you heard about the latest mass shooting? I was heartbroken uh, to hear once again that uh, we have people in our community not only who are struggling with mental illness but have access to, to guns, not only um, your average type of uh, pistol, but assault weapons, military um, uh, military weapons, and it was it was just tragic hearing that. How how have you been talking about this? Uh, not just on the air or in what you write, but with your family at home and with your church family in the sanctuary. Well, one we've been talking about the need to break the cycle of shame in and around uh, mental illness. Uh, Number two, we've been talking about how we can be uh, advocates for sensible gun control. Uh, We have a community, a nation that believes in protecting guns and not protecting children, and we need to shift uh, that paradigm. Uh, Most people who are part of the NRA believe in universal background checks, but the lobbyists within the NRA are very clear that we want to continue to ensure that guns are flowing uh, into the hands of our children because there's a profit motive. And I think that we need to shift uh, from being about profits um, and being about prophets, prophetic mm-hmm. people who are concerned about the lives of our children. You know, Otis, uh, I have had some people tell me uh, related to my work in the pulpit that uh, there's no place in the pulpit for talk about gun control. That's not a part of uh, the Bible. In fact, uh, you may have have seen the ludicrous claim uh, from the Family Research Council that uh, Jesus had affirmed carrying uh, guns. Uh, (laughs) uh, So ludicrous, that probably doesn't need to be addressed. But they tell me that it's not a subject we ought to be dealing with in church. I know you don't believe that. I don't believe that. But what do you say to a person like that? I would say that's absolutely uh, ridiculous. Uh, Number one, there are two uh, major claims that Jesus makes within the Bible uh, when he is inquired of by by a religious scholar. What's the most important scripture? He says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. But the second one is to love your neighbor as yourself. And the whole issue around uh, gun control and violence raises the question of community and the beloved community. Mm -hmm. How do we view our neighbors? Uh, Do we view our neighbors and our community uh, as a place where people are stalking and looking to kill us, or do we view it as a place where we must engage each other to ensure that we build a stronger community? And for those who speak about issues around conceal uh, and carry, um, within Chicago, we already have concealed carry, not not just legally, uh, but the reason that people are being killed is because of concealed carry. We have a flow of guns within uh, within our community. And so I think that it is a poor reading of 
Scripture, one, to claim that uh, Jesus is affirming uh, the carrying of automatic weapons. The greatest weapon that Jesus is affirming is the weapon of your mind, that we can change hearts, uh, we can change communities utilizing our mind and our heart. That's the only weapon you should be concealing, is your heart and your mind, and utilizing that to transform your community. Would you talk about the contrast between the media coverage of a mass shooting as opposed to the seeming almost dismissal of the bloodshed of America's streets, uh, particularly in a city like Chicago? Well, the media coverage of, of a mass shooting uh, usually is, is, is framed within uh, the context of it's some type of anomaly, but now it seems like, well, it's just another shooting. Um, what happens in streets every day uh, is dismissed because of the racialized imagination in America. Uh, when it's in black and brown and poor communities, we, su- we assume that that is normative. When it happens in, whether it's Connecticut or in D.C. or in Maryland or in Texas or wherever it may be, uh, we make the assumption that is an anomaly, it's an exception. Um, and we do not take into account the fact um, or as I heard, uh, Frederick Douglass Haynes, uh, who is doing our revival this week, uh, he says, uh, do not um, make a judgment about my choices until you understand uh, about uh, my options. In other words, hmm. the choices that I may make, um, you may not agree with, but you need to understand that my limited options in reference to those choices. And across the country, uh, in urban areas, in rural areas, we have people who have limited options. We have people who are in communities where uh, people are making money off of uh, guns that are flowing into our community. In Chicago, um, there you cannot buy a gun in Chicago, uh, but there are three major uh, gun stores right outside of Chicago that roughly 60% of every gun um, is purchased that is involved in a crime. Mm-hmm. Number two is that if I buy a gun, just like if I purchase a car and sell it to you, I have to transfer the title so that I can track down where that that, uh, uh, car was purchased. I cannot do that with a gun. I can buy it, and then I can sell it in Chicago, and I have no responsibility whatsoever. Just as we have a title for a car, we should have a title for a gun so that we can track down the group of people who are selling guns to irresponsible uh, young people with limited options, and we can begin to live out what Jesus says, is that we love our neighbor as ourselves. Every child's life is important, whether they are well-off or whether they are poor. It was chilling to hear that despite a history of gun violence and hallucinations, Aaron Alexis was able to legally purchase a shotgun just a few days prior to the massacre. Uh, Otis, why do you think it has been so impossible to make any headway in fixing this broken system in spite of the vast majority of Americans strongly supporting common sense changes? Uh, Money, money, (laughs) money, (laughs) and money again. Mm. Um, That the the gun lobby is not uh, focused on supporting those who who are hunting. Uh, those who are recreational shooters, but primarily uh, people who are the manufacturers of guns. And uh, if we were to put this legislation in place, we're talking about someone's bottom line being affected. And when profits uh, are under attack, uh, it is the role of the profits uh, mm-hmm. to make sure that they do not get the upper hand. And and that's really what happened. What's happening? We have a billion dollar industry. Uh, that is making money uh, off of uh, of the death of many children. Uh, we have a billion dollar industry that is funding people on Capitol Hill to ensure that they will vote a particular way, even though the majority, 85 percent of people in the NRA say, I support sensible universal background check. Mm-hmm. There is no argument. Second thing, The NRA has been fighting against the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, to do research to look at gun violence as a disease, to be able to, you know, show predictors and be able to track, um, because that, again, would affect the bottom line. And so money is in the mix. And every time money is in the mix, we will always see 
uh, people who are poor who are hurt as a result. Reverend Moss, just a few weeks ago, you wrote a heartbreakingly personal piece in Ebony Magazine. Uh, You talked about the loss of your only sister to mental illness and suicide. Uh, Would you be able to share some of your thoughts regarding what faith should teach us about mental illness? Uh, Absolutely, and uh, thank you for bringing that up, Uh, and I appreciate Ebony Magazine for publishing uh, the article that people can pick up on online uh, titled Losing Daphne. Uh, my sister, uh, Daphne uh, Moss, graduate of Spelman, uh, college graduate of Kent State University, was, was really the, the, the smartest one in our family um, and was a brilliant writer, uh, poet, and an educator and struggled with mental illness. As a child, um, she used to read to me. She was nine years my senior. We used to read James Baldwin and uh, Maya Angelou and Zora Neale Hurston and Constance Cullen to me, even though I didn't quite understand uh, everything she was reading. Uh, but I developed a love for, for literature as a result of her. But she struggled with paranoid schizophrenia and eventually took her life. Um, and, and I have been uh, an advocate, and it's taken me some time to come to grips with the issue around shame. Because within our community, the faith community, uh, we have this peculiar, strange, erroneous, and completely unbiblical, theologically not founded uh, doctrine that if someone uh, takes their life, then somehow God uh, is going to punish them for eternity. Uh, It is a disease. Mental illness is a disease, just like cancer is a disease, just like HIV is a disease, uh, just like hepatitis kidney disease, hypertension, it's a disease that can be managed, a uh, disease that can be diagnosed, and families uh, can, uh, can be helped uh, when they have the proper treatment. We need to take mental illness out of the shadows, and we need to stop uh, the theological foolishness of stating and uh, terrorizing families by saying someone who is mentally ill is not worthy of the love of God. It falls into the same category of when the Church stated that Native Americans were not worthy of the love of God, that people of African descent uh, did not have souls and were not worthy of the love of God, that women are not worthy of the love of God, uh, that people um, who are of a different sexual orientation are not of the lo- uh, worthy of the love of God. We need to remove that language from the theological lexicon and recognize, as the Scripture clearly states, as Paul stated, that nothing can separate us from the love of God. How frustrating do you think it's been for President Obama, who attended the church that you pastor while he was in Chicago, to not be able to pass any federal gun control measures and then face this kind of attack right in the nation's capital and even worse on a military installation? Well, I think it's probably heartbreaking, uh, not only for for President Obama, but uh, also for many of the activists like yourself uh, who have focused on bringing together uh, different groups of people to ensure the development of our common good. Um, you know, for a president uh, who is deeply committed, I believe, uh, to uh, seeing the, the, the common good move forward uh, and believes in, in bringing together right and left, even though it's been very difficult, uh, it must be heartbreaking and something that should be easy for us to pass, especially since the NRA uh, made a con- conscious decision, I believe it was in the 60s, late 60s, uh, to move from the focus on hunting and recreational shooting to being a lobbying organization that is strongly supported uh, by gun manufacturers. Uh, I think that that shift uh, between uh, the Johnson and and Nixon uh, administration has changed the way that we see gun legislation today. Mm. Um, It makes no sense that in Chicago or D.C. that it's easy for us to get military-grade weapons that can be used against 
other citizens. It makes no sense that someone, a responsible adult of an organization as large as the NRA, would say that we don't need gun legislation. We need more guns in schools, that we need to arm our teachers. Teachers are there to teach. They are not there uh, to uh, pull out their weapons and fire back uh, at individuals uh, and to have guns near our children, five, six, seven, eight years old, in the classroom, uh, sitting on a desk or in a holster or uh, wherever it may be. It's just absolutely ludicrous. Yeah. And we need to call these people out. If those who are in the rural areas hunting and utilizing, that's part of their culture, fine. But for someone such as me in Chicago, it just makes no sense that we can sell a gun to someone without anyone taking any type of accountability. Reverend Moss, uh, you do many things well, but I know you are preeminently a pastor. You know a lot of hurting people, and you're aware that there are a lot of hurting people in this nation. What What is your pastoral message for America at a moment like this? I think it is uh, a message, one, of of hope, and we find our hope in each other when we lean upon each other and lean upon God, uh, that we have the space uh, to cry, uh, to sing the blues, but we continue to cast our gaze knowing the gospel. And the beautiful thing about the African-American tradition is that gospel music is built on the blues, Mm -hmm. that you cannot have a gospel song unless you know a blues chord. And out of our tradition, we believe that if you know how to play the blues, you can always wrap a gospel lyric around it. (laughs) Another Another way of saying it is, in the intellectual tradition, would be if you know your existential moment, uh, you can move to eschatological hope uh, when you understand the blues. And so we are unafraid of the blues at Trinity uh, because we know that our gospel is deeply rooted in our blues. Oh, that's a powerful word. Thank you. The Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III is pastor of Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago. His moving article on the loss of his sister to mental illness and suicide, Losing Daphne, appears in the October issue of Ebony Magazine. I uh, I know that my hunch was right. You were the one to speak on this today. And Reverend Moss, I thank you so much for taking the time to be with us on State of Belief Radio. Thank you very much.